Welcome to the FA Football Forum. This podcast episode was from a series delivered back in 2020 to help support grassroots clubs and leagues. This was delivered on a webinar platform and therefore may not make too much sense unless you've got the documentation to hand, all of which is available within the description below. With this being delivered during lockdown, sometimes the audio quality may differ. Please bear that in mind. But as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any inquiries in particular to this episode or any other episode, please reach out to us by emailing clubsprogram at the fa.com. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I make it eight o'clock, so we will look to start. I know a few people are joining us um, at this moment in time, which is fantastic. So I'll let them guys trickle in. They won't miss too much in the first couple of minutes as we uh, we do our traditional spiel. So like I say, welcome everyone. A um, bit more of a, a wet and miserable uh, evening here in Essex and I, I believe it's the same around the country, um, but no worries. We are definitely here to brighten up your Wednesday evening, um, looking at the topic of community engagement, which is our second webinar uh, of a four part series and tonight we will look at the ways in which you can begin to understand the power of your local network. So who am I? Who's this individual talking? My name is Danielle Warns. I am the National Club Services Manager here at the Football Association. Um, I will be across the chat this evening so if you do have any questions that um, come to mind that you would like to ask us guest speakers, um, please don't hesitate to pop that in the chat. I will be across it. If there is anything post the event that you would like to um, raise or ask questions around, please don't hesitate to contact the clubs program at the fa.com email address. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, apologies if you have been on a few of our webinars and this is all very familiar with yourselves, but anyone that is new, if I could just ask that your microphone um, symbol, which potentially says mute me, um, is clicked on, changed to a red outline and says unmute me. That just means that you are all muted. Um, it does sound like there are maybe a few people that have slipped through the net that maybe haven't muted themselves yet. So if I could just ask that you just take a minute to check that, that would be very much appreciated just allows us to have some really good sound quality and recording quality for not only yourselves to catch up on at a later date, but for those individuals that might not have been able to join us this evening. Um, the webinar is recorded, as I've mentioned, and I will look to share that with you um, and the slide deck before the weekend. So you can then share it on to your committee members or have another recap over the weekend or wherever you, um, whenever you need to potentially just uh, revisit the content that we discussed today. And like I said earlier, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them in the chat. We've had some really good um, conversations, not only um, through questions presented by yourselves, but also people answering and, and asking each other questions on the chat function as well. So that is 100% what this evening is all about, sharing ideas, sharing best practice. Um, we don't always have the answers and you guys know um, and have some better answers than us. So the fact that you are comfortable in sharing that information is, is definitely part of this webinar series. So, ooh. Just a little bit of a recap. Um, I, I talk as if we've done a few of these and we most definitely have. And I know that we've definitely got some regular attendees. So, so welcome to you all. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, but where on earth have you been for the last eight weeks? No, I'm just kidding. I know you're all super busy, but if there is um, any of the webinars on the screen that you haven't quite managed to catch up on, please do drop that same email address, clubsprogram at the fa.com and email, and I can send you all the relevant webinars that you might have missed. They are all there. If you did miss your, uh, last week's webinar, all around common unity, um, please do again, drop the email address um, and I will be able to share them with you. The link at the bottom is just our dedicated love clubs and leagues page on the fa.com. There is relevant case studies on some of these topics that you can see on the screen now. So it's just another way of sharing that information um, in a different way. So as I mentioned right at the beginning, this is the second part of a four part series all around community engagement. Last week was an overview all about the community. 
um, and what common unity you may have with with your neighbours. Um, tonight, we're going to look at the power of your network and the individual skills. Next Wednesday, we're going to look at relationships, um, education and institutes. And on the finale, we will look at places, spaces and faces. So for those of you who joined us last week, you know that it isn't myself that leads this. It's very much led by Russ, who is one of our FA Club consultants. And Russ, I will hand over to you to kickstart off the second part of the four-part series. Thank you. What a, what a lovely introduction there. Okay. Uh, hi, folks. Thanks for having me back. If you were here last week, welcome back. If you weren't, nice to meet you. I know more than just you know a minute who I am. So as I am there, um, I'm, I'm Russ Smith. I've worked in community with coaching, with clubs, with sport development, really for the last 20 years in various settings. And this kind of series shares some of the underpinning principles to what I might have come across or seen or, you know, helped out in the last kind of those times with football. Uh, currently, I sit as a committee member for a league called the Stairbridge District Youth Football League. Uh, that's in Dudley and surrounding areas, so we have about 600 clubs and teams. Uh, I work at Wolverhampton University, that's my day job. Uh, but within football, you know, I've worked within me, you know, an array of clubs from professional to West Bromwich Albion uh, as, a, as a coach to committee members. I've even worked in other sports setting and helping up clubs. But all of it's been community driven, really, and some of the work uh, it kind of underpins those best practices to help. Uh, one little picture there for you, which I'll explain for you this week. If you just see in the middle, you see me with my friend. He's, he's called Abdul Kahar. And that was a club we set up oh, probably about 10 years ago called Real West Brom. Uh, and that was kind of a, a team which, which engaged different community members. Uh, and they're lined in as what's called the Restaurant League. So Bangladeshi, Yemeni, Pakistani, all coming together really for... Uh, Football purposes, really, and my aim there was helping them to be sustainable with some of their work as they went on. Okay, so if you've been on one of my webinars before, you know I'm quite interactive. So what I'm going to do for you is give you 30 seconds to say, have you got a pen? Do you know where your chat function is? Because I might be linking in with you guys to kind of drop in and link in and drive some of the chat as well, if that's okay. So your 30 seconds starts now. Have you got a pen? piece of paper and know where your chat function is uh, just so that as we go through some of the stuff you know i'd like you to lead and link in and share your ideas if that's all right okay so we'll just let that 10 more seconds go and we'll go to our next slide and we're joined tonight by one special guest and my other guest is joining us via the power of media that i collected yesterday so in other words uh, i did a bit of a roving reporter to share some of these uh themes of what you might hear tonight so that's phil but steve's with us tonight steve if you're there would you like to give us a hello please hello everyone hi steve steve your yeah. club's ashton where, where where is ashton it's in same side in uh, east manchester east greater manchester we're a step three club in the Northern Premier League. Brilliant. So Steve's going to share with us a little bit further down the line some of the good practice that they do in their community linking in with those networks uh, and skills that they need. All right. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. So let's go to our next slide. So last week I underpinned what was the ABCDs of community work. And this is basically an acronym for Asset Based Community Development. And what that, what that means really is looking at the strengths that's in your network, looking at solving problems, um, looking to approach things in a positive way rather than looking at it as a, this is the problem, uh, I, I don't know how to solve it. And that's kind of a good way to look at asset-based community development is it's an application of social capital really. What's in and around you and how may you be able to source some common unity to kind of solve a common problem so that people are within your local area that might be able to help you and you help them in return shall we say and it's an emphasis on those formal networks which is our theme tonight to be able to power and mobilize you know those other community assets that might be on your doorstep let's go to our next one so 
looking at your club as an example, what are the things that might be priorities, but, you know, get mixed all together. And if you look at the Lego analogy there, you know, it's just sorting out your bricks, but then putting your bricks together so that they join, strengthen and build. But some of those bricks might not be within your club. An example last week, we had Solly or Moors on. They tell us about a lot of their work with the NHS and how they've developed new programmes of work based around football as a vehicle, but the delivery very much not being kicking a ball. It might be the way that they've got new partners, new work, new funding uh, or new activities to help them to support their cause. Uh, and that share is available as a case study now, as Danielle said at the start. And our next one, please. So again, you know, the key theme of these webinars is common unity, not looking at it as it's, a, you know, it's just you as your club. It's looking at it as who might do the same thing. So that might mean, as an example, working with young people. What other organisations do that? What other organisations, for example, might use education or might have the skills as accountancy? You know, looking at some of those shared traits that you have a common unity with in and around your club. Next slide. So I gave the overview of what the principle is and in layman's terms and it's simple terms, this is what asset-based community development is, breaking it down into these five areas. The webinars covers these as kind of going into more in-depth conversations, chat, sharing of best practice and some insight for you as your club to be able to go Maybe we could try that or we haven't tried this or that didn't work for us, but maybe we could do more. We're not here as the this is the answer. We're here to share that best practice. And here's a club for an example that my daughter plays for called Cuford Eagles. If you were to put a two mile radius around where that club is, what are those five things could we find out, know, link to and help benefit and grow our club? But in return, we could help them with some things, whatever it might be. So it's more of a win-win overview. And our next slide should kind of underpin that. What's win-win? That two-way street. You're not just doing it for your aid. You might be able to benefit them in some way, shape or other. And that mobilises the assets then. It shares the problem. It aligns in the skill set and helps to grow and develop two ways of things, which therefore could become a long-lasting relationship. And our next one. So tonight then is all about individuals, the networks they're in, and that could be skills too, and your local economy. Because, you know, you guys on the call on the webinar tonight are from different parts of the country. The black country where I live is very different to Greater Manchester, which is very different to Suffolk, to the northeast, to Cornwall as an example. So what we're going to try and do, as Danielle often reminds me to, Remember, not everywhere is the black country. So we're going to share some examples which are, you know, wider across the country. And I'd like you guys to chip in as well so that we can make sure that your regional context is represented as well. Next one. So we're going to start off tonight with you. So this is where you needed that piece of paper. OK, if you got your piece of paper, what I'd like you to do is put skills and then next to it, attributes. And I'm going to give you two minutes. In that two minutes, I'd just like you to write down in your club, no matter what size it is, what are the skills that you need? But then on the next to it, under attributes, what are the attributes needed to do those skills? And I'm not going to give you too much insight into the definitions of the word yet. I want to see what you know and how that might apply to the network, but also the individuals you have at your club, okay? So your two minutes have started, have that think. What are the skills? So you're gonna list those underneath the word skills. What are the attributes? And you're gonna list those underneath the attributes there, okay? Uh, if you need a little bit of a help while this two minutes is on, you might say a skill that you need is grounds maintenance. So that could be mowing grass as an example, and an attribute could be to do that someone who's on time or someone who um, maybe is welcoming to open people into their ground. 
So what are your skills and what are your attributes? And I'm being quite wide with this question here purposely, okay? Your skills and your attributes. And we know that your clubs are of different size. Sometimes in your clubs you may have people who wear many hats. The secretary, the treasurer, who's also a coach, who also might be doing marketing. It's quite a wide role that your clubs might see. So we've just got 30 seconds to go. And it's okay if you've got three or four or 10 or 20. That's up to you in terms of the pace we work at here. Not a test unless you want it to be, and I'm sure I could get Danielle to send another T-shirt out. Okay, I think that's our two minutes. Next slide. So, here's an example, all right? Here are some of the skills that your club might need from individuals. This is the individual skills of accountancy, coaching, uh, administration, marketing, organizing, maintenance, grounds, etc. There's a wide range of things. But the attributes is all about those personal qualities that the people bring to do those roles. So, an example being willing, enthusiastic using their initiative, being passionate, uh, someone who understands. Because a lot of the time with your clubs and what you're doing, you're not working with people who do it for a paid role. It could be a volunteer, volunteer it could be a young person, uh, it could be a, a parent as an example, all right? So just in the chat box, based on the task I just gave you, would you mind sharing with me something that you think you noted down so what what was a skill that you think was really important at your club what attribute is needed to do it all right so in your chat box if you wouldn't mind maybe just pop in one in one that you think is a good example to share or showcase from your club the skill that's needed and the attribute that would help to do it well okay so i've got a couple of things coming in i'll just start to read them out just so i know so we've got um, winning workforce, okay, so administrative skills. Steve's going with media, driving enthusiasm. Yeah, you need someone you know, who's enthusiastic about that stuff. Safeguarding, personable, yeah, great one. Health and safety, but they didn't put an attribute down. <laughs> um, someone who cares after someone with empathy, yeah, great. Uh, a mediator, yeah, so someone who's, you know, might have a balanced view. Coaching, someone who's passionate, great. Let's have another look. Fundraising, someone who's a people person, okay, great. And one or two more. Groundsman who listens, yeah. I could tell you many a club who tells me differently, but yes. Um, brilliant. Okay, so we've got some good overviews there of what your understanding is of what the skill is and what the attributes are, okay? Now, they're very different, aren't they, for some things? And some of my experience has been that sometimes you need someone who's professional to do the skill. And an example being, in a large club, doing the books isn't easy, is it? The treasury skills or the accounting. And sometimes, you know, if you've got the wrong attribute or to link to the skill of doing it, sometimes it becomes a bit of a problem. And having the right skill set linked with the attribute is really important of what is in your club. Now, we all relish and, you know, really value volunteers. But sometimes we have the wrong volunteer maybe in the wrong place. And it's looking at how we can match those things up, but also complement it using some of the ABCD principles that we're going to talk through tonight, okay? And we'll go to our next slide. So your club may have some gaps, and your, your gaps really might be identified through volunteer shortage or someone not having that skill set, someone not having the right attributes or even time to even do that. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard, oh, I haven't got the time, from your committee or from a volunteer or from someone who's in your club. Pretty sure you've heard that. Give me a yes if you've heard that, because I normally say that sometimes when I'm asked to do extra jobs with some of the clubs that I have. Yeah, we've got lots of yes going on there, okay? Every other day. All the time, Anita says, yeah. So it's about what's out there that could complement and win-win, two-way street, to support some of these gaps that we have. Next slide. 
it could be that you don't really have the gap you just have someone in the wrong role so an example being that really your secretary probably isn't the best organized so that person might not be doing the right job i'm just giving that as an anecdotal one so it could be about looking at what people do and are they doing the right thing it could be that your club's grown and growing club is a great thing but sometimes it's a capacity issue as well and the capacity there is something that therefore can create you a bit of a problem and therefore you might stretch other people people might not have the time to do it or it becomes a gap and it's looking at what you can map across your club to see how you can help to grow that with the skills and the network that you may have already our next slide and and i really like this and you know when i was putting this together at the weekend often we in the world of football always look at football and football really sometimes doesn't help us because if you add football to football you're going to get football and if you always do what you do you're always going to get what you get and i suppose what my underpinning theory and principle here is is often we don't have to look at football to help us with the answers to what we might be able to build capacity with fill a gap with or add some new skills and attributes within our clubs it's out there on your doorstep but it's knowing about what networks might be able to help underpin complement, and kind of you know help you on your journey but you help them as well next slide i feel like boris with the slides here after he said it about seven times earlier um so just back to the to the chat again before we kind of share some best practice has your club ever had any own goals experiences so what that means is have you ever put someone in the wrong job or your club has had the wrong skill or attribute someone doing it have you had some gaps have the gaps been because you've grown and you know giving some of those examples means you're going to be sharing and caring that you're not on your own what we had then so i'll just go to the chat function just so i can see what you're saying we got some yes so michelle's saying yes she said yes twice michelle is it must have been twice one person doing too many jobs yeah do you know what this is something i see a lot i bet three times yeah okay heather would you would you mind just unmuting yourself for a moment and telling me what you mean by three times um well we have um in for our own experience we've had um uh somebody who came in to do maintenance for us who wasn't very skilled and <laughs> caused and caused more problems than anything good um we had a chairman who thought it was his job to help himself to money um and i can't really the other one i mean just a couple of people in the wrong places at the wrong time that shouldn't we thought they were skilled and obviously weren't brilliant thank you heather for that and, and and i think you know a lot of other people will underpin this sometimes when people bring willing it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right willing it might be the wrong skill for the wrong role or the wrong job or the right thing that needs doing and i'll just link to some of your other uh, comments here while we're here uh I, this one makes me laugh a treasurer that doesn't spend any money yeah that treats it like their own bank accounts i know about this um crossover of roles yeah good one from uh, from ray sometimes that skills gaps because someone's retired and there's no one to replace that. That, that that's a really important one especially with your clubs because someone maybe have taken on a lot of things and it's kind of been expected that they're always there so it's something to replace in the future and last one uh, expanding so treasury marketing yeah so doing a bit of everything uh, to kind of keep the glue together brilliant guys thanks for that interaction there and that's the key here isn't it most of your clubs are volunteer based but what we kind of do is always look within the club to fill the roles and if you add football to football you always get football so how we can look outside of our club and within our community whether that's two miles five miles on your doorstep or dependent on where your demographic is some of this can be helped to be filled in different ways and our next slide and the power of the network's everything 
And I'm going to introduce my friend Steve here. Steve, if you'd like to unmute and just uh, say hi again. Yeah, hello, everybody. <laughs> so Steve's just going to tell us a little bit about what Ashton United do with their community work and how they've used networks and other opportunities to help them grow with skills, network and new people to develop their football and their community work. So, Steve, we're over to you. It's all yours. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk, Russ, about um, the skills and attributes because at the outset, when we, we looked to develop our club, we were looking at the uh, what we actually needed um, and where our volunteers were going to come from. So we, we were working towards setting ourselves up as a charitable incorporated organisation. I'll perhaps come back to that later um, because that's an area that I've got some expertise in. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Hello, Diane? Oh. Hey, Steve, sorry. I can't move it on. Bear with me. I've got a small technical issue. Okay, not a worry. So, well, so here's a good example of uh, the skills and attributes of uh, IT and technology, yeah? <laughs> Sorry, it's me again. Because I'm, 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 I'm an IT nerd. Yeah, that's now problems. Well, I'll, I'll go on a little bit. The next slide actually starts to talk about volunteers, and I'm sure it's a problem that a lot of clubs have. Um, we're a small club. We play, we play at step three. Uh, because we've no money, we had to look at ways in which we could reduce our costs. And the way to do that was by working with as many volunteers as possible. But it, it's, as you said earlier, Russ, it, it isn't um, a one-way street. If you're going to get volunteers, you're going to you need those volunteers to be getting something out of it. Now, we have 70-plus registered volunteers across the club. Um, comprising of students who pick up roles in media, um, marketing, developed us um, with uh, filming matches, developed us with um, work around the ground, doing raffles. We have people with complex needs uh, in and around the club. These are people who are unemployed, lonely, isolated, learning disabled, people with mental health issues. We have family members. These are family members of players, um, family members of coaches, um, and, the, and wider. We have supporters who want to help us out as volunteers. We have team members. Some of our players want to get involved in the club in one way or another. We get neighbourhood support. These are people. These are families who want to engage with the club who might not want to be involved on the match day, but may want to get involved in organising events in and around our social facilities and we have other organizations who um, get involved in and around the club now what i'm describing today is a massive network of us reaching out into the local community but all of these people these 70 volunteers are getting something out of their volunteering and that's absolutely critical that your volunteers feel valued and they're getting something out of uh, being engaged with the football club. The club are getting fantastic return on it, but we've got to make sure, as Russ said early on, it is a two-way street. He talked about having people in with different skill sets. From that group of 70 vol registered volunteers, you can imagine the skill set that we can tap into across those volunteers because we record who they are and we also record what their skill sets are. Can we go to the next slide, please? In the early days, to get these people together and get the volunteers involved, we set up what was called Hearst Fest, which was a free, um, it's a free summer festival held on our football pitch, where we invited anybody and his dog that wanted to come along and do something on the day. All the charities to display what they what what they wanted. Um, people to sell things, any entertainers who wanted to come and entertain. And we created a family fun day that was free for local people. It was important that that was free because the area where our club is situated is in the top 2% most deprived in England. So our local people have got nothing. But they will, what they have got is time and, and effort. And by creating this, this Hearst Fest, 
we were able to provide for local people something that they've, that they've never had. Um, so, and I say it was, it was free to come as well. By putting this event on, we were able to tap into grant funding because it was free. So, for example, and you can see how, how this fits, um, in, for the first test, the first fest we put on, we managed to secure thirteen thousand pounds to put that event on from grants. Uh, we made an argument to the funder that because we were having up to two thousand people on our pitch for a festival for health and safety reasons, we needed a fully functional PA system. So three and a half grand of that went on a PA system on the football pitch. We bought cones, bibs, barriers. Um, all sorts of radios for stewards, jackets, all to put this festival on. So the correlation there is that local people got this fantastic event that's now been going for four years for free, and the football club got out of it what they wanted in terms of kit and equipment that can be used beyond the uh, the festival. Can you move on next slide, please? Here we've got some examples of the outcomes. If you're going to invite people to get involved in your football club, they want something out of it. So well, we had two asylum seekers come to us, Ken and Timothy. Ken and Timothy would been had escaped from Uganda. They were two homosexuals who were persecuted in Uganda. And a family member, in fact, was actually killed because they were gay. They came to England, they had nothing when they started. And they came to us and said, we want to learn about England, English culture. I can't tell you how good these two lads were. But their, their skills in in, uh, in Uganda, they were both they both from a banking background. And um, no, they weren't the ones that send um, email addresses, uh, emails to everybody asking to put ten million pounds in your bank account. But they were genuinely from a banking background. So we worked with them for eighteen months, uh, integrated them into the club. They became part of the family. And we've now got both of them jobs in the banking industry because they've been accepted to this country. Um, students, we've got three students, Michael, Abby and George, came to us as students to do our media for us. They ran the, the, the wrote program articles for us. They, ups, they uh, kept our web website up to scratch. They filmed matches. They provided content for programs, all sorts of stuff. Michael is now the media manager for Oldham Athletic. Abby is the assistant secretary at um, Fleetwood Football Club. And George is, has his own radio show on Same Side Radio and he's working in the media. What I'm saying is they, these students stayed with us for two years. They got the skills that they required and went on into full-time employment in the football industry because of the skill set they got with us. The other one, the picture you have there is James. James hadn't had work for 12 years. He was in bits when he came to us. Um, worked his socks off um, at the ground. You can give him any job to do and he would do it. But he was a nervous wreck, frightened to death of going for interviews and couldn't put a CV together. So we helped him with that, built up his confidence. I'm proud to say that after 12 years unemployed, he's now in full-time employment in Tameside and is a paying supporter of the football club. Um, finally, we're changing lives by what we're doing. Um, changing lives, one in particular, Lewis, one of our volunteers, came to us low in confidence. He was isolated, lonely. He had a care worker with him. Um, this, this care worker, um, they, he, um, he was full-time with Lewis, looking after him. After about six or seven weeks, Lewis started to come into the club by himself. Eventually, we took him on, we took him along with the other volunteers on a trip to the cinema. And um, he went into Manchester. Despite being 23 years of age, he'd never been to Manchester on a tram. He'd never been to the cinema by himself. And now he does that by himself. You might ask yourself, where's all this leading in, in relation to, to football? Can I have the next slide, please? It, these volunteers were being referred to us and it was creating links for us. Same side uh, population, um, Metropolitan Council, the health department, early years, children, young people. The work we were doing was touching the lives of all these departments in and around us in, in the statutory sector. 
um, local schools, we made links with schools, with the health service, with the local housing group. We weren't going out and seeking um, partnership with these people. We were just coming across them because they'd heard about our work and wanted to refer people to us and wanted to get involved. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? What does this mean to the football club? These, because we were working with volunteers, I could make an argument to a funder that we needed a volunteer coordinator because the people we were working with had special needs in terms of their, their complex needs. So we got 25K to, to fund the volunteer manager's role. That worked so well after a year. We went back to the same funder and said, we want to reach out beyond the football club and do some more work in the community. Oh, that's great. We'll give you 25 grand for a community development manager. This was backed up by another funder who gave us 20 grand to do activities. Um, we got 10, pound, 10 grand for capacity building. And what that was is to set up pop-up events around the community. But what were we doing? We bought ourselves a, a little gazebo table chairs and loads of marketing goods and we went out promoting Ashton United and Ashton United the community in the local community and at the same time encouraging more people to actually join us um, the COVID-19 we got 3k uh, for the COVID-19 community support because as soon as it kicked in we started providing uh, activity packs for people locally we started off only providing about 10 or 15 packs we're now doing 200 a week funded by external grants. You can imagine what that is doing to promote us as a community and as a football club. And, and, and where is it going? Well, where it's going, we're planning to develop our ground. And we're hoping when we develop our ground that we will, we will be supported by all the agencies that I mentioned on the previous slide. In fact, I'm not hoping, I know we will be supported by these agencies. And they will, they will they will each throw some funding in the pot to ensure that our our facilities cater for the local community. So we've been building up um, uh, this this groundswell of support for our football club for the future. If next slide, please. That's it, I've got that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the. What, what, and how does it help the football club as well? The charity, so we've got the charity and we've got the football club. The charity gets a grant and it buys services from the football club, such as room hire, catering and coaching services. We're generating this massive goodwill for fan, en fan engagement. We're increasing, increasing use of the fo footfall in the clubhouse because people are seeing what we've got and they want to be a part of our club. We've got new sources of knowledge and skills and shared resources, for example, HR legal equipment. Um, the local housing office help us with HR. Uh, through networking, what, what we did with our charity, we appointed our local MP as a patron of our charity. And it just so happens that our local MP has now just got the job as deputy leader of the Labour Party. It's like striking gold. We were struggling, we were struggling to get um, the local council to talk to us about a lease within three weeks of appointing our MP as our patron, we got a lease sorted for 35 years. So this networking, you can't do enough of it. Um, we're out, and finally, we're getting positive PR and marketing and people get to know about the football club and want to associate with the social value that we're, we're giving. People are booking weddings, funerals and the like in our football club. So our income is going up because more and more people want to be associated with us. That wraps me up then. I'll try to fly through it as fast as I can. If there's any questions, we'll take them later on. Thanks, Steve. Uh, if you can hear me, would you mind just muting, Colin? We can hear you shuffling. That's okay. Uh, Steve, this, this is really you know, a great share of what your club's doing. And I think you know the key for some of you out there is, is this didn't just happen overnight. So it's kind of grown from one thing worked by you know, linking to networks, partners and organisations in and around your club to then developing and good word passing and sharing the uh, the need of what your club's doing, really. And the key, ultimately, um, from what I've heard and what I shared before with uh, Steve said to me the other day on the phone, is none of this stuff happens miles away from your club. It's all on your doorstep. 
but it's organisations, groups who are there that automatically have some of the you know skills that you need already. And something that's really key for your assets and your community-based development is you don't have to go too far away to find it. Now, you might have two extremes of volunteers come to your club and you need to support that and you don't quite know what their skill or attribute is. But on the other hand, you might have people who come with you who might be out of work, but their previous work has been something that can help you fill a gap. Students that might be looking to fill um, a role, and, you know, an example of the club my daughter's in, they've got a great marketing officer at the moment. She's, she's a student at a college. And for her work, it's kind of linked to many outcomes, but really help that club because this person's a bit more savvy and driving forward the marketing. So it's looking at it holistically. What's in it for you, but what's in it for them? And previous clubs that I've worked with or developed and grown with, I noticed that one of the questions was, what do you give volunteers? Well, sometimes volunteers might just want a pathway to getting back into work, helping out with their education, getting them out the house, sharing it, doing it for their children. There's a range of needs, but making sure you ask that will really help because that two-way street is key. Steve, that's a great share you've just put about Twitter. So the social media element of it is a great way to get your club having more networks, more people that you can contact with. We're going to come back to Steve a little bit later with a couple of questions, okay? We've just got a couple more bits uh, to link through on this theme, and then the floor is going to be yours, all right? So before we go to Phil, uh, I'll give you the context here. So Cuford Eagles is a club in Dudley. They have around 45 teams. Uh, Phil's been with them for about six years. Uh, I went round his house yesterday, but just a bit of a warning for you. Phil's got five kids and he had the builders in. So if there is a little bit of background noise and kids asking questions, etc., just bear with us that I was in his garden and he was doing his best looking after his five kids aged between one and 11. All right, so Daniel, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll start the playing in a moment. And he's going to talk you through something that's called the Cuford card, which linked really well to the local economy, okay? Thanks, Ross. Oh, yeah, I'm just here with Phil. So, hello, Phil. Hello. Phil, um, just tell us a little bit who's your club and what you coach. So, um, I coach voluntarily for the Eagles FC in the Black Country. Um, I've been coaching uh, at level two, and I also coach at level two as well. Great. So, Cuban Eagles is your club, and one thing we're going to talk about today was a concept that came up a couple of years ago. Would you mind just telling me a little bit about what is the Cupid card and the concept behind it? Yeah, the Cupid card is, um, it fits in your wallet. It's um, uh, cost about 50 each to make. We made probably about five or six hundred of them. Um, and the reason we made the Cupid card uh, was threefold. Uh, the first one we wanted the parents to fill out a form. Um, so we could get their email, so there was a big data capture part to it, so we, we felt we had 500 members of our club and we didn't know all their email addresses, we didn't have all their uh, parents' email, maybe Auntie can come to King to watch the kids. Guys, I've just paused it. A few of you saying that you, it's hard to hear. Let me just turn up the sound um, on my computer. Ross, yeah. was that hard for you to hear as well? No, I could hear, but I turned up my sound. So I, I have my earphones in, so I don't know if that helps. Um, but it was turned up on my sound. Yes, I, I understand it's probably not the best because we use an audio file here. But it's only about three minutes, folks. So. Cool, perfect. Thanks for us. I've just turned it up, everyone. So hopefully um, that's a little bit better. If you can just turn up the, uh, the volume on your computer, that'd be really useful. I can't reply to any messages in the chat because it does turn the sound off. So I'm just going to let it play from here. She says. Oh yeah, I'm just here with Phil. So hello, Phil. Hello. About what is the Cuford card and the concept behind it? Yeah, the Cuford card is, um, it fits in your wallet. It's, um, uh, costs about 50p each to make. We made probably about five or six hundred of them. Um, and the reason we made the Cuford card uh, was 
was threefold. Uh, the first one, we wanted parents to fill out a form um, so we could get their email. So there was a big data capture part to it. So we, we felt it, we had 500 members of our club and we didn't know all their email addresses. We didn't have all their uh, parents' emails. Maybe aunties and uncles who came to watch the kids. We had these um, families visiting Cuford Eagles uh, every week and we didn't have all their emails. So we thought if we release a card, we can then data capture um, and have an email. And then we'll follow that email up with newsletters and you know, club information, etc. So the catch was, if you wanted to get a card, you had to give us an email address. So that was the first reason for doing it. Second of the three reasons was to um, uh, help with re recruitment. So, um, uh, and also the third reason would be retention. So obviously if your son or daughter plays for Cupid, they get a nice little green Cupid card on, on sign-in. It uh, makes them feel part of the club, gives them a little bit of loyalty to Cupid as a brand. So, uh, you know, this this was launched in 2016-17. At the time, Cupid had a uh, 56-ish coaches, and it had um, um, about 35 teams, and they weren't really one team. So we just tried to pull the club together, uh, and the Cupid card really helped uh, as an initiative to just give that sort of uh, a little bit of loyalty to the. Um, parents, the, you know, the managers, the coaches, the players, and it just helped. Um, what what subsequently happened was we, we upgraded the way we collect subs and we ended up getting everybody's email address. So the data capture part of it uh, became less important. So in the end, it became more simple. Whenever we had a new team create at one to seven, uh, all the parents got a coupon card each. Um, so, so those are three reasons. Uh, the first reason was uh, data capture and then the second reason was to help recruitment and help with retention. Uh, as a perk of the card, obviously, you've then got four or five hundred, maybe six hundred families uh, with a card. So they could go down to the local uh, restaurant or DIY store, or um, we've got a foot golf centre next door to the Eagle Park place where we play. And they get 10% off uh, or 20%, depending on the size of the party. Um, and that went down really well, yeah. So it's all volunteer uh, led at Cuford. So obviously, these initiatives are all reliant on people to um, drive them forward, so you need to do a little bit more than just produce five or six hundred credit cards, you need to actually drive the whole project forward. Was there um, some part of it, so when you were getting the initial data back, did it allow you to see what maybe parents' jobs or businesses want and kind of add to them? Yeah, yeah we did, yeah. We um, we did a couple of surveys at the time to help um, on the club, uh, and some of them were, you know, what do you expect from a Cupid coach type questions. Um, and then also a little bit of data capture about, you know, um, wh whether they were interested in volunteering, uh, you know, what sort of work they did. Um, but generally, the data capture part of it was about um, trying to find out who our parents were and then talk to them through a newsletter. So uh, email, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, all those things kicked off around the same time as the card. Um, and as I say, the local business is quite receptive to it. You do need to volunteer to drive that um, on an annual basis. So, um, it does need it does need managing once you've set it up. Um, but as I say, you know, if it comes, <laughs> it's all right, Danny. You can end that there if you want. I'll uh, I'll just uh, link it in if that's all right. So yeah, so, sorry about the audio there, guys. Um, but you know, hopefully you get the gist there. But if I kind of tell you the the bits of it that kind of helps and links to this theme here. So the data capture was the key bit of the Cuford card. So if you want a Cuford card, you just got to give some details. But what that really helped Cuford to do at the time was see what jobs parents did. So looking at the skills, looking at the attributes of where you might have gaps, it was a dead easy way to align, you know, well, actually, that might be something that a parent of someone at our club can already do. On the other hand, it was a way of using a card for retention. So in other words, here's my card. But you could use it at local businesses then, but not local businesses where you might have just sent letters out. You were local businesses of actually of parents of your club. So you've all probably sent a letter, an email, and had nothing back in the past. Well, this was an easier way to go directly infiltrating from inside out and an example i used to on a monday night when my wife was at work take my kids to harvester because one of the coaches from cuford 
worked at Harvester. So he got the Qford card on there, 10% off. And it was driven by Qford members to have discounts in and around the local community and link back to the economy of where the club was. And I think that's kind of the key bit of why I wanted to share this message, really. Your club will probably have already within its network that you might not know about some of the skills and some of the gaps and some of the businesses that can really help you to develop or sustain or grow. It depends on what you're doing. The concept of the card was just an easy win of getting that in your hand easier. Because once it started, people wanted to know, where do I get my Qford card? Where do you get it from? And then word of mouth spread. Other people get their card. I'm getting a discount at foot golf, or I can take my family to the Indian restaurant for cheaper. I can go to the bike shop, whatever it might be. Local economy that was driven for by current members already, but it's knowing that. Because the data collection that you might tend to get in your club already is just about player registration and emergency contacts. It was looking wider than that and spending 30, 40p on a card updating it but then every time a newsletter went out here's where you can use your Qford card it was an easy way to generate more business links and aligning it back into how you can link in with those parents that might actually be a job a card that could link into a place of discount if you needed it or a potential sponsor or funder but aligning in locally to where the club is Okay, hopefully I've given that value there as well. I've still got my Qford card in my uh, in my phone wallet. So, you know, it's something that's quite a simple thing to do. But we can align in a bit more back in the questions when we get there. All right. Next slide, please. So your networks are everything. And where your club is, some of the big networks which you might not be aware of, I've put on here. So every local authority area will have a voluntary sector council. And that's something that's across the whole spectrum of care, sport, uh, social work, economy, business, where like Steve had went through in his presentation, you can be referred people to help you within your club, maybe for the skills that you need. And it's something that's quite simply to join if you don't know about that. A Google search straight away with your area and voluntary sector council will help you to find the contact in the website of who's there. Uh, active partnerships used to be called CSPs. And last week uh, I went into those a little bit more. But additionally, every um, local area, so county really is how it looks, has an active partnership. And sport-wise, they're kind of tasked with getting more people active, helping out local business economy through inactivity uh, and aligning in through other people to help them to achieve that strategic aim. So where I live, Active Black Countries are active partnership, but there's one in every county of England. So if you don't have a, a relationship with them, Google again, active partnerships, you will be able to find your local one. And not many football clubs link with them. It's predominantly historic that they link more with the other sports clubs or with Leisure Trust as an example. But you're just as eligible as anyone else with the work that you're doing. Becky last week from Solly on Mall spoke to you a little bit more about your Chamber of Commerce. So looking at, you know, that network of business or that network of how you can align back into growth and in the economy within your local area again like the other two they have regional versions of it quick google search will get that and often they do what are called networking activities and during this period that we're in at the moment that might be digital but obviously you know when things might change they do do breakfast lunches you know things that you can turn up to and align back into what your club might be to kind of fill some of the gaps that you need and the NHS Trusts and Foundations, this is a really big one for you, especially post-COVID-19, to just have a relationship in for your club. Because I mentioned last week about social prescribing, and Steve's mentioned today about people with complex needs. There's going to be, you know, a big, a big amount of need for people to have sport, exercise, volunteering, 
as part of an offer to help us with our country and getting us back, you know, into a way of operating as normal. But there will be people that need opportunities. Some of these people may have been unemployed or lost their job as part of this, but it could be a stepping stone back into it. And there are you know, monies, grants associated with this, but it also could be a win-win. It could help you with where you want to be. So those are the kind of the big four networks. Do you know about them where you are? And if you don't, have a look at which ones might help and sort to you. Because actually, as Steve's evidenced really well, it can really help and grow capacity within your club if you need it. And also pay for some of the skills and some of the workforce if you need it. Because it will help out on wider savings on society. Next slide. And the key really is, is underpinning all the stuff on our individuals and networks to help to grow and develop the plan that might help your club. We understand that not all clubs have a full-time community section with paid staff, but I'd also work with clubs that do so much community work and everyone's a volunteer. So, for an example, simple things like raising uh, monies for charities through donation of clothes, helping out with, an um, example, hosting activities, using your site for various things. Look at the moment, for an example, we, we've got kids who can't go to school, but yet they're talking in government about Operation Catch-Up. Can your club site be a part of these conversations or things that go forward? Because they're going to be asking those networks that I showed on the previous slide that could link into some things that you could be able to align to in the summer and for the future. But if you're not in the room, you can't have a say. So getting your foot in the door and linking in and networking with the aim of win-win can really help you there. Making sure that your um, organisation is compliant for that is key too. And do you know what? You don't have to be the expert of everything. You don't have to wear all the hats all the time. There's people out there who can help and align this to you. Looking at that network that can help you maybe be a charity. Maybe link in as part of your organisation structure, even about treasury skills and aligning in with safeguarding. There's a wide range of things that's out there to help you. And I think this is a good point for us to say individual skills and networks and the local economy that's in and around you, it's, it's on your doorstep. But you've got to kind of go to them sometimes as well as you getting the benefits when it comes to you. And I think, Danielle, this is a good place that we might look at the chat and have some questions for myself and Steve, if that's OK. So I've seen a few things popping up. Yeah, most definitely. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Steve. Again, another really insightful um, content and, and your thoughts around the topic, which is great. Um, I've just scrolled up to the top. Um, I'm just having a look now. At some of the questions that have come in and I, I feel like Rush, you've answered Anita's question just around um, kind of what offerings are there out there for volunteers? I think this was when Steve was talking. Um, she mentioned that you appreciate kind of great to gain experience, but is there anything else that was being offered? And, and I know you highlighted that around it kind of being two way. Um, yeah, Daniel, I'd probably say there for, for young people, there is an FA young, uh, young person's volunteer toolkit which I think maybe on this webinar share you are attached to it. That came out last year and it was about youth councils. Uh, there you go, Sarah shared it. I think Sarah was youth council. I think, I think I've met Sarah. So, yeah, so that was something that was updated. But simple things are often the best things in my experiences of rewarding volunteers. Sometimes by asking them what, what, how, or what or how can I help you is a key because, you know, you might not retain them, but you might help them to the next step. Steve mentioned about the two guys who worked in banking. Now they work in banking, but they just wanted to practice some of their skills. Simple things could even help, like I often have chats with clubs about the skill sets that are right or wrong. And One club was talking to me about the amount of fines they get because their coaches can't do admin. I'm sure some of you have had that as well. And my conversation was, well, do you want your coaches to coach or do you want them to do admin? And the secretary wanted them to do both. But I said, well, that's probably the wrong way to look at it. So how do you reward admin is that skill? And they came up with a quite simple solution of if someone was a volunteer and looked to do the simple things like registration, 
a recording of results, team sheets, etc., etc. They got a discount on subs, or they might have got a coat, or you know, some simple things that were easy to administer, but were probably with a better skill set to do it. Okay, thanks, Russ. Um, I think Kara's got some really good ideas, probably similar to some of the concepts you just mentioned there, but definitely around the idea of, of getting those young people in and, and uh, potentially working with students to, to kind of feel um, maybe some of the skill gaps that you identified earlier, so that's great. Um, so Harge has got a question which is, Probably for both yourself, Ross and Steve. Um, I think this was when Steve was talking. You mentioned a few different funds that you'd managed to, to secure. Um, were they local? Were they national? Um, be good to get an insight on that because obviously funding is, is a big topic for clubs. Dan sorry, Danielle, you broke up then. What? What? You asked me a question about what? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Steve. So to hard to start just around um, some of the funding that you mentioned. Was it local? Was it national? Or was it a bit of both? Some of those partners you worked with. A mixture. The local housing association, um, the uh, are very good. They've got small grant pots, five hundred quid here, thousand pound there. Um, the awards for all are from the big lottery. You can apply for up to ten thousand pound. We we applied and we got nine thousand eight hundred, I think it was. We did, um, and with that funding, as I said, we did the pop up events. But we also applied for funding to um, take all our volunteers away, but all our trustees away, on a business planning weekend and get some support from an external consultant to draw together a business plan. And it just so happened that what we did at the start of the of the event, we did a benchmarking to see where we were. So we had held an event where we brought all our interested part, all our interested stakeholders together, and it just happened to be that it was a, a one of our home games for the football club. So we hired the sponsors lounge for the day to put this nice event on for people, which killed two birds with one stone. The funding paid for a sponsorship at the football club, but it was cheaper than going to a hotel down the road and, and it enticed people to come in and talk to us about what they wanted. We got some new volunteers from that, some new trustees. And then we brought a consultant in, in who worked with us on business planning and we went away for a weekend to do it on a business planning exercise. Um, and and th there is funding out there for this kind of stuff. It's just knowing where to go for it. Um, the, as I said, Awards for All was one. The health authority, because we were working with so many people with complex needs, I went to the health authority and said, look, you know, our people in and around our club haven't got the skills to work with these people on an ad hoc voluntary basis. We need somebody more more permanent. And the, the NHS says, yeah, we agree. You've got some good outcomes. We'll fund you. They gave us 25K. So it, it's there, but you've got to start somewhere. There's no point just saying we want some money. You've got to prove that you you know that you can actually do it. You can deliver it, and that means a bit of legwork at the outset by you know working with you know working with people and putting some time and effort in. I think um, I'm going to answer one of the things that was just popping up while Steve was talking there. Um, so I think the question was about do you use professional bid writers, etc. Well, if you go back to my comment about the networks that you're in, all the data for most of the things of your demographic of where your club is already exists. And active partnerships, for an example, will be able to show you and tell you the demog sorry, the geographic area, the ethnicity breakdown, local economy, health, um, educational status for for your club for your area. Um, and if for an example, you're in these networks, it's really easy for you just to ask for this data and get it for free. And this then will help to align uh, what is your need. More importantly, help to write that bid for you. So rather than you paying someone as a bid writer, all the stuff's there. Russ, just to add to that as well, um, I know that there's obviously some questions around funding and the active partners do 
normally I know I can only speak on behalf of Active Essex, um, but they will have a specific funding section that is local and national. Um, so they are a great source, not only for the information that Russ has mentioned, but also to then try and link in what funding avenues are potentially out there um, as a quick resource point. Um, so I definitely recommend um, off the back of that, just looking at who your active partner is um, and just exploring a little bit more around what they do. Because like Russ said, it's definitely one of the most underutilised um, resources from a football perspective. Um, call to action for you guys to go and check that out, most definitely. Um, I know, Steve, you've come back to a few that have got a, a keen interest to understand some role descriptions for um, either a volunteer manager or the community development manager. And I know you've said you'd share that. Um, and I'm sure a few more people would be interested in that. So if, if you're happy to share that with me and I can share uh, wider, that would be that would obviously be great. We can have a chat about that offline. But... Yeah, I've got a list of um, role, um, job and person specs for volunteer roles albeit a level three uh, club but you know they, they're there to be tweaked so I'll, I'll share them with you um, I might have already done that so we can talk about that offline and probably the best thing is for people who want these things it'll certainly help me if they contact you rather than me because I'm inundated at the moment as you can all imagine <laughs> Steve, no worries. And just to add to that, and I know Sarah's on the call today and I've shared her a few things, but we are working at a, um, a list of, of role descriptions at the FA that we can share. Like Steve said, though, they are very much going to be a guide for you to tweak and adjust depending on your club, what you need that individual to do, etc. Um, so probably really good timing, Steve, that um, just refresh me with what you've got and I can cross-reference with what I've been working on today. So, uh, no, good timing. They're expensive, you know, they're very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we'll have that conversation offline. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got another question um, coming from Wes uh, asking, can you please offer some advice surrounding establishing these networks for new teams that are in the infancy stages of development? Russ, I guess before you jump in there, probably the first webinar is definitely a good starting point for Wes. Is there any other maybe top tips? for maybe those that couldn't catch us last week around really starting to develop those networks? Yeah, I mean, dead simple, on your phone, Google Maps, and type in what you're looking for. So it could be, for an example, show where my club is and the nearest schools or the nearest um, accountants. It will, it will help you map just some of the things that you're looking for a bit easier. And then you've got that kind of way up of what do I need? How do I do it? As Phil said with the Cuford card, Data capture, you 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 know you you customers. Um, Steve, can I just ask if you muted Steve because it's just a bit of background noise off you, pal. Sorry, it's all right, pal. Um, so just use that data capture tool as you can. So one of the things I often help coaches and clubs with is if you've never used it before, Google Forms don't half save you some time. Because by utilising a simple data capture mechanism, you're not constantly going back to people. And going back to people um, sometimes is annoying, isn't it? Because you think, oh, what do they want now? But think about the data capture that you want and that you want to design. Parents' role, what's their job, could be as well with their school. Simple details that can really help to build the picture that will help you get your community work underway and widen uh, the web. Steve, you've got something to say as well? Yeah, you don't have to do all this work yourself. There are community champions out there, people who are community activists who have all these networks. If you find the right kind of community champion, have a conversation with them. They'll do all the legwork for you and you can concentrate on your football and your football club. That's what we did. I have a, a community champion that just unlocks every single door that I want un unlocking for me. She's worked in the community for 30 years, knows everybody. So I've just made her my new best friend. And she's running around everywhere for us. And we're saying, well, if you need any support from us, let us know. And we'll use our charity status to 
um, attract funding for you to do your work around the community. And we both get a win-win out of it. Well, it's three wins because the community gets the win as well. And, and your voluntary council will have community champions. So that might be the first port call if you don't, you know, if you don't necessarily know who that community champion is. There are these roles and there are community activists out there who are passionate about where you live and your club is. And you can just help and aid and twin it together. And as Steve said, it's going to be a win-win. You get a lot of the stuff on your doorstep that they know that you can help them with and they help you with. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, a really good comment from uh, M. Seymour, uh, just suggesting that actually local colleges are a great source for volunteers and club placements. Um, all to support their, their course programs. Um, I know there's some changes in the education program coming in and we probably won't talk too much on that now. So we've definitely got a whole hour and a half next week, but it's definitely a really good comment there. Look at your local educational establishments and we'll certainly talk in more detail. Dave is looking for a reliable um, building contractor. So if there's anyone on here that can help David out, mm. that'd be great. Uh, David, probably some of the comments that the guys have shared around looking at your local networks, looking at those that are involved in your club that might help. You've mentioned around um, your changing rooms. I definitely suggest contacting your local county FA to see um, how they can support as well, especially as it around a, a capital project. They may be able to, uh, to support you with some of your thinking around that. Danielle, yeah, I'm, ahead, just, I'm, I'm just going to make something aware about that. So, yes, definitely with your with your facilities, Football Foundation, County FA. But something I got to know about a few years ago was something that was called Section 106. So you might have never heard of this, right? I might be talking gibberish to you. But the reason why it's good for you to know what Section 106 is if you've got people building new houses in and around your footprint of your club, Section 106 is some leisure facility spend that has to go back into the in and surrounding area for community facilities. Now, there is a growth of new house builds and affordable properties across England. It's a government strategy. So if that is something on your doorstep, it could be something that potentially could help you match fund as well and look to develop what you might have uh, as part of that. So just remember that section 106, it's a, it's a law, it's an act that any new building of properties has to invest back into the local community into some leisure facilities. Good information there, Russ. Good information. Um, Dahar just got another a really, good, really good question, actually. Um, and it's all around how clubs can protect themselves against maybe recruiting the wrong volunteer. Now, I don't know if you've experienced in your time, Russ, that. I know that people were quite open and honest at the start to say that they might not have the right people in in the right roles, possibly. But what, what are maybe some of the steps that the clubs and leagues can do just to protect themselves, to, to maybe not go through um, uh, a, a long-winded, maybe process if they have potentially got the the wrong the, the volunteer that may be in the wrong role um, or might not have the right skill sets that might just need to be kind of repositioned where somewhere else in the club have you got any kind of experiences yeah. in that Russ or good, some good ideas um, I, I think I'll, I'll go first I'm sure Steve's got something to add as well so really so if I start with young people so if you're some of these roles or gaps or skills you're looking to do with uh, young people, often it's a bit of a, a period of let's just have a bit of a, like with your mortgage and your phone contract, a bit of a let's see how it goes before we continue it any further, like a cooling off period, should we say. But I think the better you can find out why they want to volunteer, the better volunteer you're going to get. Don't just always jump in with a, this person can breathe, you're on the committee because sometimes you're going to get that wrong skill set in the wrong role and end up with the treasurer who don't spend his money you know the different things that are not going to help you getting to know them is a really key thing and i'm not saying you do the, you're the best friend and you're around for dinner and all that but finding out why is a really key thing to help and aid that 
And Steve, you know, I'm going to hand over to him about the role descriptors, really. And sometimes that's a little bit of help to guide you when things might not go so well. I think what, what you need to do is don't just, when a volunteer rocks up at the door, just say, right, oh, all my prayers are answered. I want to use this person. I've got a gap here. Let them let people grow into the room and try, if you can, have a hierarchy. You know, a new volunteer comes in, they start out trying a few things, find out what suits them best. And rather than just keep volunteers in one role all the time, rotate them as much as possible. Because if one drops out, then you're succession planning for that particular role. Really good point, especially if you are new or you might be working with um, referrals from uh, various charities or organisations, that wider skill set can be kind of learnt together. And it could be that you have, you know, you might design for your club a pathway, like a roadmap. So once you've done 10 hours, then you might be able to do something else, et cetera, et cetera. Something that can therefore be clear and concise because... Volunteering is the two-way thing again. The volunteer might think that you're the wrong organisation for them. So it's a, an easy way to kind of map it, rotate it, but develop both with a win-win attitude. Perfect. Thanks, guys. I'm just having a look through the chat now. Lots of, uh, <laughs> lots of people being excited by the, uh, the new terminology of Section 106. Um, don't be, don't be that know. excited, folks, because it, <laughs> it is money and it is law. But trust me, it's all about your council, yeah? You need to have the network there. Yeah. I think someone has mentioned that, and it can be allocated very quickly. Um, but it is also, like Russ said, just something to be aware of. Um, it's not easy to receive, Michelle. You're, you're absolutely right. But, again, if people are aware of it, it could um open the doors for conversations and if it's not potentially about section 106 money it could be a new connection that you've made within the local authority that you might not have made before so maybe don't always think with that one goal in mind um have potentially a broader mindset as to what else that initial conversation could potentially start and i guess that probably comes back to some of your points that you've made throughout the two webinars for us is kind of just look bigger and wider and try and build those networks, understand who is around there and that might be able to support you on potentially more than one thing that you might have originally gone to them for. I think an interesting bit to kind of broaden that a little bit. So the wider some of the networks you might be with, and let's go back to like what I said about active partnerships, NHS, uh, voluntary council sectors, etc. I've probably had in my career with clubs, leagues, sport event, whatever, so many times come April time, oh, we need to shift this bit of money. Can you help us? Because there's an underspend or someone's not done their job somewhere else. And if you're in that network of your club, then that network's quite simply easy just to give you some money, like Steve's evidence, to, to get some outcomes. Another way about, you know, just using what you might have. So if you're a club, for an example, of 10 teams, you might therefore have a network of... 200 people, well, that's really hard to get if you're a business, 200 people straight away. So it's using those shared outcomes and shared bits of investment, whether it's cash on or in kind, and you can easily access these things together, but you've just got a touch point together and become that glue uh, of that network and relationship over time. Thanks, guys. Just flicking through. Um, da -da 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 -da. Hopefully, I haven't missed anything. Uh, oh, one has popped in around. Um, you might know for us, obviously, with with Phil's absence. Um, and I think you, I think you might have mentioned that. to the Cuford card. Did Phil mention there about fifty p a card? Yeah. So there's, there's a range of costs for them. They're about thirty, forty p, whatever it is. You can buy them in bulk. You can buy them in the you know the millions if you want. But they, I think they cost around um, twenty five p, and then there was another twenty five p I'd been charged that they put on it. So all they did was charge a pound to kind of get everyone a Cupid card, and then that was just the baseline. You always have your Cupid card, and there's always going to be new offers on them. And there's you know, your local printing company will make cards, but on the other hand, if you 
know your local printing company. And you said to them, well, actually, this is going out to 600 people. If people want workwear or trophies or whatever it might be, can we signpost them your way? And you become a, a beneficiary of the Cuford card. And normally it's an easier conversation because you've got the network that they might want to get into. And the card really just sits in your wallet. And if you have a Cuford card and you're in an accessible business or place that you might go, get it out. 10% off, job done, happy days. Even the barber had it. And the barber was a simple one of, you know, you can, use, you can come with your kids. Kids, I think I think they kind of looked at their non-busy days, uh, Mondays, um, Tuesdays, etc. And it was just cheaper if you were a Cuford card member. Just simple things. But because you have the network or some of the network came from within your club, so some of the parents where they worked in their businesses, it just made a simple and easy way uh, to get that network of your local economy and what was in and around on your doorstep. Speaking of doorstep, um, good question that's come in from Sarah. Um, quite a few of the case studies uh, been, uh, and clubs are within larger towns. What's potentially some advice for those that are smaller or in more rural areas? Um, and that might as well answer... Um, a question from a club in the Channel Islands as well, where maybe funding opportunities are a little bit more limited. So just probably, yeah, just what, what else What else do people do, Russ, if things are um, maybe not as local as uh, the bigger clubs in the bigger towns, for example? Uniform. Go on, Steve. I think it's important to do your research. Know your audience. Know what's there. Don't just head off out like a, a bull in a china shop. Have a look round, look what's available. I mean, Alderney, Alderney for example, um, I'm guessing that might be an area where you've got some quite a few high net worth individuals living on the island. Work out, you know, do some research into them, find out what the corporate social responsibility policies are for their companies, and you might get their companies to donate to your football club on Alderney. I'm just I'm playing this off the top of my head. I mean, it, 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 do the research properly and find out what's about. Also, amongst the members, um, a lot of companies through the corporate social responsibility will match what their employees get when they when they're fundraising. So, if you put a car boot sale on, for argument's sake, and you make five hundred quid, if you go to somebody in your club who works for one of those types of companies, they'll double it, and you've done nothing by making contact with a member of your club. Good share, good share. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely back up about doing your research. Social media tells you everything nowadays, doesn't it? Really, as well, does that help you? Um, also, look at things. So, if you're more rural, so existing groups that might be within, you know, you might have to widen your footprint. It might not be two miles; it might be ten miles. But things like uniformed groups, scouts, beavers, guides, etc., that might be a workforce that can help you when it might come to festivals, tournaments, as an example. Uh, could be the fact that there might be some of your members are the same as their members. It's definitely going to be across the country, uh, different transport needs. But again, there are charitable and groups such as community transport, welfare, social care that's different. You might be able to help them with something. And on the same hand, they might be able to help you. It really does go back to having a look at your doorstep, seeing what's out there, mapping it, maybe auditing what you've already got and what you need, to then just making that contact. And as Becky rightfully said last week from Solly or Moors, sometimes you don't have common unity at first, but you never shut that door because there might be that time when that door needs to be reopened. Always touch base but never shut the door. They might shut the door on you, but you always leave it ajar. It might not just be there yet, because there is there and there are always needs uh, that's win-win. Brilliant, thank you. Hayton, I think, backs it up, saying um, they've done that with an employee at DHL. So obviously a similar concept, possibly, to, to what Steve said. Um, around getting some potential match funding. It looks like they've potentially done that with an employee at DHL, um, which is good. Um, I'm just looking through now. The I saw one was about the, the database. How was it stored for GDPR for QFID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, good spot, pass right? Password protected. 
um, only accessible by uh, committee members. Um, you know, the, the normal safeguards that you would have on an encrypted file, really. It wasn't like, you know, a load of pieces of paper in the boot of the car. There is as well, if any, I know we're going slightly off topic, but it's, it's definitely relevant. If anyone does need any further support or guidance on GDPR, the FA um, work with a company called Muckle LLP, and they have a whole training resource section on GDPR, which has been specifically designed for clubs. So that resource was kind of created when the changes in law came about. So if anyone is worried about that um, and would like to just freshen up, especially around some of the uh, the examples that Paul gave around his card and you might want to take that back to committee and just worry about that GDPR. Russ's example is absolutely spot on, but there are some training um, sessions and resources if you'd like to gain further insight. Just to share one club that I came across about two years ago, and it's not in the Black Country, you'll be happy to know. It's in the North East. Uh, they were called Newcastle East End. And a lot of the work that they did uh, wider to, you know, normal football was in and around disability and linking to rest bite care. So, for an example, there might be a lot of uh, adults with disability or children and opportunities to play football was linked to, you know, their parents or their carers a bit of a rest and the club kind of took up uh, a bit of mantle from that from what i remember and these are some of the welfare areas that we'll kind of link into next week with institutions we'll also widen it a bit more with what some of you talked about with students with universities to align that in and i think daniel if you just go to the next slide i've kind of segued that in in well to kind of finish us up tonight is the stuff that we've learned today about your networks will complement with some of the work around schools, uh, around your uniform services, your police. Uh, and, and I'll give you one example, you know, one of the clubs I've worked with have helped to save their local police force um, an estimated around £100,000 because of their diversion of young adult males. But in return, that's helped to reduce crime and they've evidenced it through police statistics as and when the club are doing things. Um, link to that to university and your workforce, um, NHS, health, wellbeing. And these are going to be really important partnerships for you post, you know, COVID lockdown and how your club can really make a difference, create a partnership and have that wider network can really help your club uh, develop, sustain, and be that community club that you might want them to be in the future if you're not already doing some of this stuff. Brilliant. Thanks, Russ. Um, it looks like the majority of questions in the chat have come to an end, which is brilliant. Um, it just leaves me to say, Russ, Steve, thank you ever so much again. Steve, thank you very much for your insight. It's so important that we get a club to give their perspective. I know Russ has got some fantastic knowledge and has been in and around clubs in the grassroots environment, but it's always um, just as important to have you on there. And, and I can only thank you for joining us. And I'm sure everyone will uh, join me in thanking you for the insight you've given. It's very, very useful. Russ, again, thank you very much. Much appreciated um, yeah. for your support. We've definitely done this slide around questions, but if there is anything that does pop in to your mind, um, when you try and shut off to go to bed or you have your coffee tomorrow morning, please do drop clubs program at the fa.com and email and we will look to answer that as soon as possible. If you have joined us this evening from a league, our grassroots technology tech team, very, uh, very wordy, but these guys are absolutely fantastic. They will be doing a series um, of webinars all around full time. So if you have joined us from a league, um, this evening, there is a link at the bottom where you can register for the upcoming um, full time webinars and going back to what we're looking at next week, Russ, I think we've mentioned this a few times, but just in case anyone didn't capture it, we are looking next week at how you can build relationships with education establishments in your community. So the majority of you scanning the uh, sign up sheets already signed up, which is fantastic if there is anyone 
else from your committee or someone else you know that this could be of benefit to, please do share the link um, that you have already registered with to them so we can get as many people on next week's webinar as possible. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the FA Football Forum. If you like this episode and you want any more information, please visit thefa.com forward slash clubs and leagues or email clubsprogram at thefa.com. If you want a monthly dose of this content, be sure to search the Grassroots Football Hub on YouTube or find In The Box on your favourite podcast provider. This is the podcast supporting grassroots clubs and leagues be the best places to play and enjoy the game.